When we look at music education, instrumental music education uh, that is offered for young people, very young people, we see a couple different things. We might see a lot of young people in a large setting where the ratio is, uh, the student to teacher ratio is very large, where the uh, children are um, offered an instrumental opportunity via percussive instruments where what they are learning is uh, note duration, note value perhaps, um, dynamics. And what we see here is exposure to many general music concepts. Um, and in this type of setting, it, if a student were to say, I would like to hone my interests and, and focus my attention on one particular instrument, a lot of times uh, they are not afforded that opportunity until typically fourth, fifth, sixth grade when band and orchestra enters the scene. There appears to be a gap. Um, in contrast to this, we also see um, instrumental music education afforded to very young people. Um, many of us have seen that violin pro child prodigy or that piano um, child prodigy, and not all, but quite possibly many of these children um, have been brought up in the Suzuki method. Uh, Suzuki method um, developed by Dr. Shinichi Suzuki, who um, developed the Suzuki method also known as talent education. Talent education, I'm going to delve into exactly what that is. So in this type of setting, we have a smaller student to teacher ratio, and I'm going to go into, as the lecture proceeds, exactly what a Suzuki education is. Um, let me go into a little about who Dr. Shinichi Suzuki was. He was a Japanese man who um, relocated as an adult to Germany and had difficulty at that stage in life picking up the language. And all the while around him, he observed that German children had no trouble picking up the language. Um, and so this language acquisition raised the question, how are they able to pick it up so quickly? And um, he concluded that immersion and being surrounded by it, hearing it all the time, um, helped pick up the language. And this is the fuel behind his music education, picking up a language from a very early age. Suzuki has a very rich history with some instruments, such as violin, of course, and piano. Um, it also has more new instruments on the scene that have been around established for a little while, such as recorder, harp, guitar, cello, and then definitely newest on the scene are the wind instruments. So here we see a trumpet Suzuki method and a flute Suzuki method. Um, there does not at the moment exist a clarinet Suzuki method. And if one were to be created, perhaps we should turn to the existing flute method and its master teacher, uh, the teachings of uh, Toshio Takahashi. So I'm going to delve into some of Mr. Takahashi's um, uh, teachings. My lecture today is going to cover um, what is the Suzuki method and why does it work. Secondly, if we were to transfer a Suzuki method to clarinet, uh, what adaptations might need to be implemented in order to have more success since having a violin exact transfer over to clarinet has obvious um, challenges. Um, thirdly, I did analysis in my paper of two previous studies already done, one by John Sperti in the 1970s and one by Richard Lane um, also in the 1970s. Both of these people were clarinet players and they had studied uh, in contrast a Suzuki group and a um, control group that was taught more traditionally and they contrasted. And then lastly, um, I'm going to delve into some suggested material uh, for books one through five of A Clarinet Method. So perhaps if we're considering um, a Suzuki um, wind instrument um, creation, we should turn to what do we see across the world. I did some looking into, um, in Germany, they have the Jedenkind Ein Instrument, 
which translates to every child an instrument. Um, their motivation is especially for the underserved to put, a, it's a publicly financed program, to put an um, instrument into every child's hands. Um, and all children grades two through four receive this um, benefit. They have lessons each week um, and meet in full orchestra or band one time per week. In the United Kingdom, they also value early music um, instrumental education and um, it's also publicly financed. Uh, one of the instrument makers I interview, which I will discuss later, uh, was a part of this United Kingdom um, drive to put instruments into young people's hands. In China, um, they do have instrumental music after school. It is considered a privilege um, and a useful tool to enter the next uh, grade level. They have national standards, as do we, that pull, draw upon more general percussive-based instruments and um, instrumental. And they uh, draw upon uh, these percussive instruments as an uh, outlet for creative improvisation to line up with their standards. Um, my, my motivation in my study is to pull from Suzuki what works to make changes to um, existing um, Suzuki elements that might more successfully uh, transfer to clarinet um, and some proposed solutions there. So what is Suzuki and why does it work? Um, clearly, um, as Mr. Suz uh, Dr. Suzuki saw himself, when children are immersed in the language, they pick it up through listening. Um, Suzuki believes in starting children very young and because at young age they pick things up very quickly. Um, Suzuki definitely believes in rote learning, again, since it is an immersion and a very listening-centric uh, methodology, rote learning is prevalent. Um, and in doing so, they pick up pattern recognition and they have the capacity to imitate others and are immersed with older peers, which is also a way to learn uh, more quickly. Um, Suzuki does not eliminate reading of music, but instead believes in delaying reading. Um, they also believe in providing a very small instrument to the child. Um, so before a violin player acquires their 1 16th violin, uh, the, the little child will make their own instrument, sometimes out of cardboard, because nothing will happen if something happens to it. And so small instrument is critical. Um, all of Suzuki books draw upon core literature for the instrument, and this is the fuel for learning fundamental steps along the way. And they believe in setting a very high standard. Again, this comes back to that rote learning. Possibly it could be argued that if a child is um, double um, multitasking with decoding what a second space note is, perhaps they're not thinking so much about their posture or, or whether they are doing things properly. So setting a high standard. Um, a trademark of Suzuki is the triangle. Triangle made up of three sides, and those three sides are the parent involvement, the teacher involvement, and the child. And together, this they work as a team. So the parent attends the lessons with the teacher and the child. The parent is picking up the material uh, and becomes the at-home cheerleader. So if we are talking with about very young children picking up instruments, of course, they will need some guidance and reminders from parents, and it's helpful to have that third side. Suzuki believes in having fun, so although fun is not the main purpose, it is instead the means towards the end, um, many children will attend their lessons and have a whole shopping list of things that they have learned, but not be able to articulate what they are. Instead, they walk away and say, that was fun. So uh, another name for the Suzuki method is, the, is talent education, and what talent education means is that talent is not inborn, but rather talent can be developed. So some people would say, oh, I just don't have a knack for music and I can't pick it up. Suzuki would say, that is not the case. Every child can. In fact, um, a preliminary course for teachers studying to become Suzuki trained is called Every Child Can. And it is that 
talent can be taught. Um, Suzuki believes in private lessons in, as well as group lessons. And repetition is a trademark to the method. Um, so when a child may learn um, a handful of pieces in book one, those pieces never really disappear. They may return to them um, in year three with always the aim of improving them and making them better. So the second part of today's lecture, I'm going to discuss possible hurdles that we might see if we transfer a pure Suzuki method to clarinet and some changes that might, might work better. Um, unfortunately, there does exist a divide between some Suzuki proponents and traditional people. Um, some parents in the Suzuki line tend to think that um, when put with traditional learners, there's just a difference there. Um, and some traditional teachers would say that Suzuki uh, teachers are perhaps not held to the same standard. Um, some people argue the sound verse, uh, before symbol might actually serve as a hurdle uh, to the learner. Certainly we do not aim to have um, children, musicians grow up needing or relying upon how a piece goes in order to learn it. So it is not doing a service to do without the reading of music. Um, and some people would argue what about the proper sized instrument. Um, also a possible hurdle is just education. Parents may not understand or see the benefit of at-home help nor be simply able to provide it. Parents are professionals, they are busy, they are carting around um, other siblings where they need to go. Um, possibly there's a so socioeconomic um, part of the discussion that needs to be brought in. And so regarding busy parents and the socioeconomic, perhaps outreach on the benefits of at-home learning um, is a starting point. I'm going to now kind of discuss um, two studies I researched, um, previously done in the 1970s, one by John Sperti and the other Richard Lane. Uh, both of these clarinet players and teachers had a Suzuki group um, in comparison to traditional learners as a control group. Um, and so I'll discuss each of the findings um, separately. Spare T, um, and I do want to start that both of these studies use some Suzuki elements but are not pure, pure Suzuki. So it, let me discuss the ways in which that is. With Spare T, he started with fourth grade learners. He did 14, or excuse me, 16 weeks of rote learning followed by 16 weeks of note learning. There was parental supervision. Um, he recommended 20, 30 minutes of practice per day um, and listening was central to his study. Um, Lane, in comparison, um, adapted clarinet literature from a violin method. Um, and I will discuss possible conflicts with that as we go. He had later learners, so again, that is questionably um, Suzuki. He did not have parental involvement and again used listening and imitation. Um, so the observations from both studies comparing Suzuki versus traditional were um, the Suzuki learners had fewer dropouts, they achieved more milestones, and they had more confident positive attitudes. So were we to bring a Suzuki method to clarinet, what from Suzuki unaltered would transfer very well? Firstly, using quality literature. Um, secondly, of course, we've already discussed immersion and listening. That has to be central. Three, calling upon a master teacher. So of course, with violin, violin was developed by Dr. Shinichi Suzuki. Um, and then I already discussed with flute, the master teacher was Toshio Takahashi. And since the only existing Suzuki method that um, maybe closely relates to the clarinet would be flute, a lot of my um, research did go into Takahashi's teaching. Namely, he uses a tone um, image of a fish, and so the, the tone has an entrance, uh, a beginning, a middle, and end, just like a fish has an entrance, a color, and a ver reverberation. Um, Takahashi drew upon the teachings of the French school 
very much. So what is that? That is an open sound with lightning quick articulation. Um, he, in his teachings, also used imitation, similar to a mother tongue language. So children pick up a language because the parent frequently points out what an object is. Um, Takahashi used frequent singing and imagery. Because so many of the Suzuki pieces in, the, in book one um, follow ABA form or a binary form, form is a t frequent topic. Um, Interestingly, Takahashi used um, the idea of teaching trills before scales, which is, is a neat idea in that it isolates one finger, and we, we still have to open our ears hugely to hear equal sound between the lower and the upper. Um, Takahashi, oh, excuse me, what we would also transfer um, unaltered from Suzuki would be small class sizes, um, emphasizing repetition and review, and of course, starting very early. Not all of a pure Suzuki method would transfer exactly unaltered to clarinet. So what from it would need some changing? Um, starting a three-year-old on clarinet is very unlikely to work, uh, simply because even if we have a small size instrument, it is necessary to cover the holes fully and completely, and at that age, I don't believe that would be possible, never mind the weight of the instrument too, in, too heavy. So what I'm suggesting is starting in more of a pre-band um, age, so that would be second grade, third grade, or age seven to nine. We have to have a small instrument, just like all the other uh, methods do. So I'm suggesting an E-flat clarinet. It is not too heavy. Um, we have to start at a time when, oh, and this is another reason why we would not want to start in kindergarten first grade, unlike the other instruments. Uh, what is happening in kindergarten for a child? One of these first four front teeth is being lost. They lose those teeth, and those are the teeth that are central for playing clarinet. Um, an E-flat clarinet weight allows for the right hand coverage. I interviewed two E-flat clarinet makers. Um, the first maker is, is called a Nuvo, um, and their motivation uh, came from the fact that many band directors have a pre-band series, which is their recorder series. And because in going from recorder to band, band directors recognize a little bit of dropout. Um, and th that is simply because um, the transfer from recorder to clarinet is too dissimilar. The wind resistance is not the same. There is no read. A lot of the fingerings are not the same. So Nuvo's motivation was to build an instrument that really did, um, was similar, a similar transfer to clarinet. And their instrument, after having played it, I will say, does feel similar to a clarinet. Um, these instruments are durable and lightweight. Interestingly, they are in the key of C, which to a child doesn't really matter, might only benefit the band director. These instruments come in colors and they are made of plastic. Another instrument maker I interviewed uh, was J.P. Packer, and this is the maker uh, that had been a part of that United Kingdom um, push to, to get instruments into children's hands. And these instruments do look like more professional E-flat clarinets. They are black, um, however, they are made of resin. Um, and like the Nuvo, they have simplified key work. So unlike the regular clarinet where we have four pinky keys on the right and three pinky keys on the left, uh, these instruments have only one option for C and one option for B, so that's two on the right and two on the left. I'm suggesting, thirdly, that we infuse reading into a listening-centered uh, method and that we make that fun. So by um, keeping the rote learning there, we are able to focus on our hand position, posture, embouchure, but when, um, when we have reading as a part of that, it becomes possibly too much so that we keep these as separate ideas. Um, why would we delay reading in second and third grade when in second and third grade they are reading books, they have full understanding of left, right, left, right, left, right. It makes sense that symbol equals this. If this B is buh, then we should know that that second space is also A. I'm suggesting we keep them as separate activities. So what if 
we had a three time per week course and that the first two, so Monday, Wednesday course were playing only, that we're learning new material, reviewing all the time, and that the last day, Friday of the week, is only reading and writing music, and that the reading and writing music is fun, and that we are learning basics of melody writing and what constructs a chord, and in given parameters of perhaps writing a three chord progression, playing these melodies and playing these progressions for our peers, and of course keeping this fun, that fun is not the purpose, but it is the means to the end. This keeps this brings about a camaraderie amongst the children together. Fourthly, I, we, regarding parental involvement, I'm suggesting that this is volunteer basis. Um, again, if we are dealing with a three-year-old, they really need that help. If we are dealing with a third grader, there's a little bit of independence there. Um, understandably, parents are too busy. Um, but of course, a welcoming uh, feeling that all parents are invited. I'm suggesting more frequent, shorter sessions. Of course, this is dependent upon administration allowing that, which is, of course is a hurdle sometimes. Of course, we need to have a master pedagogue. Um, the clarinet history goes back just like flute to the Paris Conservatory. Um, Robert Marcellus, uh, most clarinet teachers would agree, has been the grandfather teacher to all of us. Robert Marcellus's heritage exists in the Paris Conservatory. He was taught by Daniel Bernard, who was taught by Lefebvre, who was taught by Rose, who was taught by Close at the Paris Conservatory. Marcellus uh, emphasized so much the proper usage and speed of wind and the shape and the voicing of wind. He used a tennis ball to help with the curvature of the fingers. Seventh, I'm suggesting an adaptation where we bring in a comprehensive program to make more of a complete musician. Here I'm piggybacking on the research of Karen Romeo, uh, Karen Williams Romeo, where um, yes, we focus on technique and repertoire, but that we bring in history too. Why not, with each new piece, discuss the period it came from, the stylistic tendencies and the composer's tendencies? Um, that we bring in theory and art skills. So um, why not have an international unit through listening? Every child can study their own um, family history and bring that as a part of uh, music discussion. Bringing in chamber music. Um, Kelly Osterman had done um, a study where she did look at that Lane, Richard Lane study, and questioned, understandably, why bring, why make a transposed violin book that the clarinet players play, since the violin book was written progressively so that it made sense um, that the violinist is learning in order what they should, that would not transfer directly to clarinet. Um, so Kelly Osterman's dissertation goes through um, methods and, and fundamentals that should be taught in a certain order and then tying and lining up certain pieces to go with those fundamentals. And that brings me to the details of the literature. So, and I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on, on book one and a little bit um, less on book five, but um, book one I'm suggesting, oh, and let me also say that in the paper I, wrote about many pieces, and in today's discussion, I'm going to highlight only a few. Um, all clarinet players would agree we have to have left-hand mastery before right, so the pieces that I suggest um, focus and give lots of opportunity for left-hand learning. Um, regarding articulation, I suggest why wait? Many a clarinet student I have taught who did articulation incorrectly or perhaps didn't articulate and instead got by with hoo, 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 hoo. And it is harder to fix that than to learn articulation properly in the beginning. So I am suggesting that the teacher turn the barrel, the mouthpiece barrel around, that the teacher do the fingerings of Twinkle Twinkle, uh, which is only a six note song, and that the only thing the child focuses on is articulation. So Mississippi Hot Dog, Mississippi Hot Dog is a standard in all of the Suzuki books. Why would it not exist in the clarinet book? And it serves as a platform to teach articulation, as seen here. Um, after 
articulation, um, another very important thing in book one for the child is um, the left hand pointer finger roll. And so I'm suggesting a really great way to do that is from F sharp to A. So I'm suggesting um, lightly roll in the key of D. So ordinarily for traditional learning, we would really not see a key in um, book one in the key of D, a piece in the key of D. Um, but again, if we are focusing on doing things properly and the child is maybe not seeing the music, um, what does it matter what key it is in? Um, so I think doing that in the key of D is a good thing. strongly is very helpful to a child is the left hand pointer and the uh, left hand thumb rocking. There's a piece I have included in there. Dum -dee -dum -bum 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 -bum. So B flat to E has that rocking and rolling action. Kids get excited about rock and roll. I'm going to move on to book two. Um, this is where the introduction to the break happens. Um, so the break is in various books introduced different ways. So most commonly we see it flipping up, so we start low and then we flip up, but some of them suggest staying in the upper register, which is a, another very good way. Um, in my suggestion here, I'm, I'm recommending that we have a note that jumps over the break once and that we add pieces that require it more, more often. Um, there's also a chord study there where the jumping over the break happens more quickly. And then the, the piece that really targets it once they've gotten frequently over the break is Wild Horseman. <laughs>
um, a piece that would be a conversation over the um, whole tone scale. It is a pattern, each measure is a pattern, but each pattern starting one whole step lower. Bum, bee, bum, bee, dum, bee, dum, bum, down, dog, body, body, etc. Um, also in book three is a major piece in the clarinet repertoire, Schumann's fantasy piece, which is an exercise in three versus four with the clarinet and piano. subdivisions but help, helpfully it, um, in a helpful way it is um, writing out the ornamentation so un, unlike having a mordant which we might see it does write the subdivision which I think is helpful um, and then moving on to book four um, the second movement of Finzi's five bagatelles is an excellent uh, launching point for breath control smooth connected playing and no breath at the bar line
Tchaikovsky's uh, string quartet number one, opus 11, um, is rewritten here in the key of B, um, has a subdivision with written ornamentation, and is a challenging key to be smooth and connected. Also inside of book four, um, adding Cromer, Cromer's first concerto, third movement, uh, brings about a historical conversation. So just as Karen William Romeo's um, had suggested a um, more comprehensive curriculum, this brings in that historical conversation. Cromer wrote a double concerto. Uh, he lived at the, in Vienna at the time of, excuse me, he lived in Vienna as did Mozart. Um, and similar to Mozart in Cromer's music, we can hear the light playfulness. Also, uh, Cromer draws upon some Weber influence in that there is a sustained dram um, dramatic ending, as did Weber.
by Bagatelle. This has uh, difficult fingering passages such as low B, C, sharp, D natural inside of a slur done very quickly. Requires excellent intonation in the upper register, fluid, no fluid knowledge of scales, um, and similar to the Mozart divertimento requires is, is more practice in stop articulation. Thank you. 
perhaps these are ways in which um, every child can um, have a talent, education talent that can be developed.